welcome to the Jazz Roundtable, brought to you by Live at Zero BPM, with your host, Grammy Award-winning percussionist and mallet player, Billy Holting. Tonight's guests, John Dixon, Tom Varner, and Bill Warnick. If you care to donate, click on the donate slash tip jar link in the description or on our website at live at zero bpm.com slash tip jar. You can also tip on Venmo at zero bpm. And now let's get to the music with your host, Billy Halting. Hey, everybody out there in internet land. I, I, of course, like three seconds before we go live, you know, YouTube is telling me it's not working. So, uh, it, but it does seem to be working. I'm looking at it on my phone, but I don't know if I can chat with you or not. So we're going to find out what happens with that. Anyway, welcome to the Jazz Roundtable. We are doing something so cool and unique tonight. We're doing jazz French horn. And I'm sure there are a few of you out there that didn't even know that was a thing. So we ended up, because this is International Horn uh, Symposium Week in the world, we got three incredible uh, French horn players to come out and talk about it, jazz French horn players. So let me bring these guys up right now, and I will say hello. But let me just start out by saying we are 100% tip-based. So, you know, like the video, subscribe. And if you want to tip, the, I'll put the links up in there. If I can get to YouTube, <laughs> I will put them there. But uh, we'll figure that out. And uh, let's let's introduce everybody. So we got Mr. John Dixon here. Hey and there. then we have, oh, I don't it. have my hand claps on. I got my audience's uh, <laughs> muted. <laughs> uh, and then we have Mr. Tom Varner. Woo. Imagine everybody. Uh, hey, oh, everybody. Come on. Uh, welcome to professional audio broadcasting. There we go. There we go. <laughs> and here is. Okay, it's not plugged in. Anyway, <laughs> so, and then we have Bill Warnick here. So we're going to talk a lot about the French horn tonight and jazz. We've got some audio clips and video stuff. And uh, let's just jump right into it. Let's start with Bill. I'm going to talk to Bill for a second here. Bill is, has been, you've been playing jazz French horn. You started with the master way back in the day. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I was just, in, while I was in Manus College of Music, I was informed that there was going to be a, an audition for the Symphony of New World. And I went and auditioned. Turned out to be a low horn audition. I won it out of the 15 people there. And I went into the first rehearsal, and Julius Watkins is playing third horn. And he is the kind of the, the guy that started it all, right? Yes. I mean, he was the first person to sit up there and just be able to read changes on the horn. And how did you meet him again? You were playing in the... Well, I had met him, my, I guess, my first, the spring of 1969. I saw, a friend of mine saw an ad in the New York Village Voice, the newspaper that's now defunct. Um, Ju what was it? Julie Landsman, who used to be first horn in Metropolitan Opera. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, let's go hear this. So we both jumped in her car and we went down to the Third Street Music Settlement in New York. And that was the first time I heard jazz French horn in person. And that's when I met Julius Watkins. And I, little did I know, three years later I'd be sitting next to him in a professional orchestra. That's great. And... Uh... Now, you weren't improvising at that point in time, were you? No. You were just uh, playing in the group. Now, I, you sent me a, let me put this up here. This is a program from Carnegie Hall. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this concert? Well, when this came out in 1975, I had been playing extra with uh, the Gil Evans Big Band. And um, they had started doing a... Um, Newport in New York series for the New York Newport Jazz Festival, but it would be taking place in New York City uh, with George Wayne doing it. And um, I was playing extra with the Gil Evans band from about the, I guess it was the spring of 72. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up doing this. They had established a New York Jazz Repertory Orchestra, and as you can see there, they're about there are uh, some five French horn players. Yeah. 
and we're all playing um, these charts, uh, Gil Evans charts, which are quite dense. It's not like a usual jazz chart, which is relatively open. These mm -hmm. are quite dense, and um, the only person that got the solo there would have been Julius Watkins. Yeah. But um, it was a, we had a great group there. I mean, as you can see, um, they put it back up there. Dave Sanborn is on saxophone there. Billy yeah. Harper and Trevor Coker. So, um, and uh, we still had a Lou Soloff on trumpet. Wow. So, in that <laughs> so it was a pretty hot group at that time. So you were saying in that group of five French horn players, only Julius was improvising. Yes. The rest of us had our written parts out. Right. Now, were you getting and into it was, improvisation then? or? I was starting to work on it then. Mm -hmm. like I had been playing in the Gil Evans' big band for a year or so then. Wow. So I, started, I was starting to work on it and everything. And... Um, Let's put it this way, as your two other guests can tell you, <laughs> it's difficult on horn since we're a fourth away from the rest of the band. Right. Everybody else is in C or maybe B flat, and we're sitting there in F. So a e piece that's in E major for the group, for us, is in B major. Ah, yikes. That's <laughs> so it can be rather part. tricky on a horn. I understand. That's cool. Um, let's see, I wanted to ask you, well, let's go back to your origin story. You said you didn't even start out on French horn. No, my, when I got in junior high school, they didn't have middle schools back then. Um, they didn't have French horns in my school, so I started, picked up violin. Oh. And I, I didn't, they got French horns just as I was graduating, uh, moving on to high school. And I was good friends with the, uh, band director, so I got, he let me take one over the summer. And that was the first time I started playing on French horn. Uh -huh. Oh, interesting. So, uh, well, let me, let me bring the guys back in here because I think, uh, well, we'll get to, to everybody, but Tom had a question for yes. you. <laughs> I'll take questions from the audience, but, uh, but let's see, Tom had a really good question for Bill. Um, let's see, a couple things. Um, I knew about the Symphony of the New World. I just wanted the lay people out there to know this is, has nothing to do with the group that's in Miami. In the mid-70s, was, there was a, an effort because of, you know, historical oppression, basically, and, and um, discrimination, that it was very hard for African-American musicians to play in classical orchestras. And they said, you know what, we're going to make, make this special group happen. So it was from the get-go, I think, planned to be an integrated um, orchestra. And it was wonderful that they were able to do that. Um, and so Julius, who had um, been really the pioneer jazz French horn player, um, was also in this group with, um, with Bill and many, many, many other greats. Um, but Bill, my question to you was, was that when you were then at Manus, when you started to play in the Symphony of the New World? Yes. All right. I was in Manus College of Music. I was in my third year. I was just starting my third year when I won the audition to the orchestra. Right. And then so. fr freelancing and playing with the, the Gill Band at different times, was that just after Manus? Yes. That was after Manus. That would have been in 73. Right, okay. Because I know in 74, 75, 76, um, often Gill, if he did not have Julius, he then started to use John Clark and Peter Gordon. And, um, yes. I, on the... One record, I think it was Peter Gordon. I saw that band live, 74, with Peter, but then the recording yes. of when they did the music of um, Jimi Hendrix, that was with John. Jimi Hendrix. Pretty, yeah. Yeah, that was with John. That was with John, and um, that was some, some wonderful stuff, but I know you were working with that band during that time period, which is 
Well, I was playing extra. I was sort of, you know, if one of the others was busy, they would call me and I'd come in, do the, right. the we would run down the charts on Monday afternoon. And actually, that's an interesting story. Um, what happens is the Thad Jones Mel Lewis band well, had right. been at, at Village Vanguard forever on Monday nights. They took off and went on a European tour. And they just, and it turns out, Thad Jones just stayed over there right. and started living in Sweden. Um, so they, uh, Gil Evans' band was doing Monday, every Monday night at the Village Vanguard. So that's how I ended up being there. And um, the first time I got called, I it was, let's see, what's his name here? I think Pete Levin called me. He couldn't make mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And he was calling me. Sharon Freeman said, oh, call Bill. So I went in there and like, you know, <laughs> a million notes on the page and yeah. it's going 90 miles an hour and very freestyle. <laughs> and um, I was thought about it for the longest time. They called me on Sunday to play Monday. And I was saying, should I do this? Should I not? Should I do this? And I called back an hour later and said, I sh should do it. The problem was Tuesday, I had to play the Mozart third concerto with orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, playing in a hundred and something decibel <laughs> basement at the Village Vanguard in the Monday evening and then doing um, Mozart Third on Tuesday was a little tricky. My my teacher heard the tape and he said, wow, you didn't miss a note, it sounds great, but you sound very tired. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> I never did tell him why I was right. sounded tired. <laughs> In those days at the Village Vanguard, you would play often a third set. So you might play till three in the morning and then you get home, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what happens. Yeah. Well, let's let's yeah. go back to, uh, to Julius for a second. I'm going to play a little video clip of him and, uh, and, you can, and I'd like to hear what you guys think of what he did for moving the instrument forward, especially in the world of jazz. Let me find this video. Here it is. Let's check this out. When I do the show notes, I'll put that uh, I'll put that link out in the show notes. You can find that. As we'll have links to a lot more stuff we're going to talk about tonight. But that's Julius. And uh, and Bill, how long did you work with him or know him up, up out in New York? Well, I knew him until he died. You know, I can't went out to his house a number of times in New Jersey. There, mm. um, his wife actually played violin in the orchestra also. I see. So I, you know, I got to know him quite well, um, and there were times in the orchestra when we'd have a sort of a pops concert, 
And I guess Brooks Tillotson was on first, uh, Bill Hamilton on second, Julius on third, myself on fourth. And we'd go out in the breaks between the rehearsal and the concert and come back somewhat uh, mm -hmm. in an altered state, I would say. And he would be able to play perfectly. Yeah. And the rest of us are like, how's he doing that? <laughs> the rest Still. of us are looking for the horn. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, uh, that's great. I, I want to get to Tom, but I just, we have a lot of people uh, uh, watching on YouTube. We have Victor from Brazil. Hi, Victor. We have yes. Jackalope hey, Brassworks. Hey, Victor. Jackalope Bra Brassworks from Portland. Yay. And then uh, Keiichi from Japan, who says Yay. he plays no. not only classical music, but also improvisation nice. on the French horn. Victor from Brazil is a French horn player. David Rampart says hi from Australia. And, uh, and, uh, I'm assuming David is a French horn player. Also, these are new, these are new faces in our in our chat rooms. And then <laughs> over on the Facebook side, we have our regulars. Phil and Kim are here, and Tawny is here. Tawny is the one that kind of facilitated all this. So, Yay. hi, Tawny. And uh, if Joyce is here. Says uh, he. She asks, "How about playing some David Amram playing French horn?" I don't have any clips up of David, but uh, we can look for some and mm. put them in the show notes later on. So. But, uh, yes, I, I should have. Int I was um, thinking of people to to list, and in those early pioneers, there was Julius Watkins, there was John Gross, and there was Willie Ruff. But there was also David Amram, who was a composer and a French horn player, and and sort of jack of all trades, crazy everything man. And um, but he was a good jazz French horn player, and is still going today. Wow. Um, oh yes, and he. He played often with Julius in the Oscar Pettiford big band when they had yes. two horns. And he also played on a beautiful record by Kenny Dorham called Blue Spring. And that it would be easy to, to put a link up for. Kenny Dorham, Blue Spring. Okay. Um, where it was with Cannibal Adderley, Kenny Dorham, and David Amram. And, and David um, Amram. And there's, there was quite a few others but he considered Julius uh, a friend and a, and a real comrade and um, um, so that's that's a great um, reminder to mention David Amram as well right. yes now Tom <clears throat> you yourself you have 14 CDs out as a leader and you've played on over 70 other recordings how did you get started playing jazz on the French horn we started well on classical good and made question I, I started in fourth grade, mm -hmm. right on French horn, no, no yeah. violin, oh. no trumpet, no nothing, mm -hmm. in suburban New Jersey, <laughs> on a little single B flat, single yes. olds B flat, which I still have. It's just yeah. like behind that door, <laughs> and um, <laughs> then in and I played that single B flat for a long time. In junior, in sophomore, in high school, started to get more into jazz because my other friends were into it. Mm -hmm. But I had been very much into classical music and played in. Um, small, you know, community orchestras and my high school orchestra. And when I was a senior, I played my Mozart horn concerto too. But by the time I was a, even a sophomore, junior in high school, a lot of my friends were into jazz and I've been listening to Miles Davis and Clifford Brown and um, um, Freddie Hubbard mm -hmm. and the sort of fusion of the day, Chick Corea and Mahavishnu Orchestra. And then pretty quickly maybe when i was a senior i had a next door neighbor said check this out here's a a, Th a thelonious monk record with julius Watkins," and that was the first time i heard an improviser on the instrument taking a solo not on, not just in the background and that was a big light bulb for me it was kind of like well this is kind of what i want to do and um so from knowing about Julius and then knowing about, there were others, all of us quickly seeing there are others. There was John Clark. Um, there were, was, maybe I knew about David Amram too. I had maybe met David Amram. I was in suburban New Jersey. So once I was in college, um, that as a college freshman, I had the chance to go also go out to Julius Watkins house in Montclair and take a few lessons with him and talk I just asked him a million questions so I'm very blessed that I got to nice. meet him also that was 
January, February of 76. Um, and then, so sadly, he died in April 77. Right. And I always wanted to tell him, I'm, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. And um, I never got a chance to, which was a lesson right there. Tell people who, me, who mean, to, mean a lot to you, tell them, you're doing, you're doing it, you're doing your thing. So, so I knew about Julius then, and then I just sort of like, well, if Julius can do it, and if John Clark can do it, and then I started to find out more about um, Vincent Chancy and um, um, other people, then I'm like, okay, I'm going to try to do this too. So I kind of was a stubborn, crazy 17, 18, 19-year-old and just sort of tried to b break through those um, technical barriers of being able to play a steady stream of eighth notes in a swinging way without being stiff. That was really hard. The biggest um, thing was to be able to play swinging um, lines the way a tenor sax could or a trumpet could. Right. And that was like two years of work with a metronome. And then then you can do it. And now there's many, many, many people out there that can do that now, which is wonderful. When I was finding out about Julius, I knew that there were like five people out there. Mm -hmm. And it's so wonderful now, we're talking 40 years later, right. um, 45 years later? 40, uh, I don't know. But um, <laughs> um, we, we won't talk about that. There are now hundreds. It's so wonderful. Some of them are out there. You know, um, well, you're gonna shoot younger, me a list younger people, can, you they're can, doing it. Yeah. You can shoot me a list. I'll put that in the show notes as well. But yeah. I'm gonna, oh, I yeah. made, I don't know if people can see, I made a nice little <laughs> list of um, <laughs> Julius, John, John Grass, Willie Ruff, um, but I'll send that to you, Billy. Um, we'll definitely put that up so people can search um, some people. We'll try to find some links yeah. also. But uh, right. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play some stuff. This is. I, I made a medley of some of the things you had. Oh, that's then, fine. And then I have cool. a separate piece which was really pretty. I wanted to play, but let's just. We can all listen okay. to this and interpretive dances aloud while we're listening. So. Huh. So, nice. Yeah. Oh, it's good to hear you. Yeah, nice. Yeah, 
<laughs> I don't know if you nice guys mix. can hear that, but the audience is really into it. So, um, <laughs> that's great, Tom. And now, th those are just, uh, you sent me a bunch of stuff and it was all great. I just didn't want to play two st stuff that's too that long. That was perfect. But I've got another piece of yours, which was one of my favorites that I saved for several. We'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, what are you doing now? Are you out playing clubs or are you just doing well, recordings during all this? Uh, um, so um, I finished college. I was at a sort of um, normal, quote, unquote, normal liberal arts college for two years. And then I transferred to New England Conservatory and got a bachelor's mm -hmm. in music. Um, in jazz French horn, they let me do that at wow. New England Conservatory. Mm -hmm. Gunther had just left, but he made it, he kind of, they were like totally fine with that. Um, and moved to New York right away, because I was from New Jersey anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, so from 79 on till 2005, I was just a general freelancer, day job person, touring, making CDs, playing in different things, but much more on the jazz side mm -hmm. and or improv, improvisational music side things, but not totally. New music, um, um, contemporary music, um, things like that as well, um, till 05. And then in 05, I moved to Seattle, and now I'm teaching full time at Cornish College of the Arts. So in Seattle, of course, the last 18 months is not so easy but yeah. now starting to play out again i've already just played two two um very nice concerts um in the last two weeks and oh, it's nice. slowly starting again and um um so i'm looking forward to that i've been writing more um this that last piece there's a couple of those pieces was a no net but with no no guitar no piano it was just seven winds and bass and drums. So it was very kind of, well, definitely Gil Evans influenced. Mm -hmm. um, some of those other groups were um, groups of two saxes, French horn, bass and drums. Oh. That's what I've done a lot. So you're doing a lot of writing for the three voices and playing with that in sort of chamber music meets jazz right. in many ways. So that's what I've been doing. 40 years <laughs> now. It's a similar but, story um, we hear from lots of musicians, you know, just right. the, the kind of and, work um, day But touring, it, in the 80s and 90s and early 00s, I went to Europe a lot. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would be in New York, I would play in groups in Switzerland or in Holland or Germany with, there would be like half Americans, half Europeans, and they would have various projects, and I'd be busy with that. And you'd, you'd be in New York, you go to Europe, you come back, do another project, go to blah, 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 a lot of that over those years. Now, of course, not as much. And, um, and I've just raised two teenagers who are now 18 and 20. So, um, so um, that's, that's been, that's been the last <laughs> few years as well. Okay. Well, going back so that's to, what I've been up to what, what are the, this could be a general question for any of you, the, why aren't more French there? Why aren't there more well-known French horn? jazz players you think just because the numbers are small or because it's a uh, such a difficult instrument anyway I, this, just adding jazz onto it add a whole other layer of what's going on you can, I, I, John? I can answer that I can tell you that because I haven't done it near as long as these guys have and I haven't played uh, horn as long as they have uh, the physics of the instrument itself make it very unpredictable and um, very hard to, it's hard enough to play a scale cleanly on this horn um, after you've practiced it for for years much less to play something that is spontaneous the the length of the instrument combined with the tiny width of the instrument makes it uh, extremely wide range and um, extremely small targets for the notes that we play and so physically, it's just it's an it's a incredibly difficult instrument to get around on, uh, especially uh, technically. And you can listen to uh, most of the repertoire for the horn takes advantage of the things it does do well. And playing long running strings of sixteenths and things is not what our repertoire sounds like. And the other thing, um, because our repertoire is not like that, horn players don't practice the way jazz players do. They don't, generally speaking, they. We have so many technical hurdles to get over in terms of 
getting comfortable with the harmonic series, getting smoothly over across four plus octaves of the horn, mm -hmm. um, learning the repertoire that we do have. So if you are going to work in a symphony uh, position, you can know that repertoire. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a very difficult discipline just to get good at playing horn, not to mention trying to create a good tone. Right. All these other things. And then you combine with that the immense, endless, boundless technical um, requirements of being a good jazz player because now you've got all the different harmonic structures, all the connective tissue, chord changes and the like in every key, every mode, if you're being serious. And it's, I think for a lot of people, it's just too much. It's just too much. Well, now, there, um, I see we have a lot of French horn players here, but there are some people I recognize that are not French horn players. Could you, I see you've got a horn uh, back on your right. Could you pick it up and show it to everybody and explain? When you say it's longer than other instruments, you can explain. It's just the tubing. There's a lot. You're talking distance. to me? I'm talking to you, John. You're talking oh. to me? All right. Hang uh, on. Well, actually, maybe <laughs> it's not, not the special new horn, but the other one against the green screen. Got it. No, I, I can show it. you. No, no, no. If I'm going to go another see. way. Oh, okay. I'm going to go another way. There you go. There you go. So just... um, this is yeah. a double. This is a double horn. Uh, this is an, an Atkinson model, but it's a Geyer uh, model. It was designed uh, by a fellow in the in Chicago back in the I guess the 30s, give or take. But it's on um, on. There's two horns here. There's one on the outside. These pipes. Mm -hmm. This is a horn in F, and it's a good uh, 12 plus feet long uh, without extending it with the valves. And then on the inside, there's another horn, and this oh, one wow. is pitched in. This one is pitched in B flat, <laughs> and you get to it with this little thumb uh, trigger switch back and forth. So the harmonic series of one. <laughs> pitched up a fourth so as you can tell it's a very slippery instrument <laughs> well and also to begin the, with the mouthpiece is quite different isn't yeah. it from a trumpet or a trombone it's tiny it's just it's it's, and it's hellishly deeper tiny. right it's a it's a more of a cone than just a, a bowl correct yeah some of them are um there's a bit of a cup shape to this one some of them are more v-shaped um it's just the the it, the instrument is such a bear to 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 play well in its normal state and if you start adding all the other factors that a jazz musician has to deal with it just makes it a it's a big hill to climb mm -hmm. and you were also saying telling me yesterday we were talking about it that it the french horn it has rotary valves as opposed to piston valves uh yeah these this particular one does so and when you press the key it actually is rotating to to change the direction the the, the tube yeah. or whatever you call it. okay as opposed to a trumpet where you push it down a piston and it changes the so there, and you were explaining yeah. to me. Said, so, "Well, you've got this other new fancy horn. Do you want to pull well, that?" Well, yeah, out? the the one, and I. These guys will be interested in this. John Clark actually, uh, right, has been playing with the idea of doing something like this. This is made by a guy named uh, Jim Patterson. Uh, he's in Las Cruces, and this is not, this is not the horn that he's gonna eventually have. But it's uh, it's it's basically right. based on a mellophone, and that's a. That's a four-letter word for a lot of horn players, um, <laughs> and and I mean that exactly how it sounds, because it's typically a horn that gets used on the marching field. Um, there there are some inherent flaws uh, involved in the shortcuts and the the sacrifices that had to be made from a, a standard single F horn in order to make it this way. Um, what Jim is in the process of doing, and I think John uh, Clark spoke with him about it first. But I think this would be interesting for a lot of cats that, that play jazz especially is he's just looking to correct some of the things that are inherently wrong in the beast. It's a, you know, Stan Kenton wrote in uh, his band for a section full of a version of this. It wasn't this yeah. shape. Um, and usually it was trumpet players playing those. Um, and um, the range was very high and the pitch was usually, you know, questionable. And... Um, what Jim's trying to do with this is correct some of those issues 
and try to bring what uh, I think John Clark calls this a hornet. I think that's a, a phrase yes. he... T- uh, I heard uh, him play one in 77, I think. Wow. Yeah, they've been working on this for a while, but I, I got to <laughs> yeah. say, Jim's Jim's coming around to some, some good ideas on it. Um, it's pitched in F alto, so it's an octave higher. <laughs> It's pitched. It's pitched pretty high, um, and that gives you a little bit of, of uh, facility. It gives you a little bit of room to goose around and not slip on so many um, lower harmonics. Um, it's got the piston valves on it. So it gives you some of the the tools that trumpet players have mm-hmm. for creating smears and blends and and things like that. Um, it's played on a normal horn mouthpiece, so it's not going to hmm. throw guys that. But you're using that want to play ugly, with a good pitch. You know, they want to keep their. Yeah. Do not. You're you're using the other hand than you normally use on a French horn, right? Yeah, for me, you know what, I, I'm not a, uh, traditionally a jazz horn player although i'm getting into it more largely because of tom uh because of a project that tom did uh this during you know lockdown um that uh, maybe he can tell you about it was a thing we oh, did on YouTube. i'll send and that I, to you billy yeah oh, great i just found it so so refreshing and 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 fun to be a part of it it was just a little piece of a thing that i did for it but it it was very exciting i really enjoyed doing it and but oddly enough, I have more of a connection. I'm primarily a piano player. That's what I started. I was 20, 20, between 20 and 21 when I started horn, so I came to it really late. Um, and it played trumpet as a kid, and somehow um, in this musical context, I'd rather come at it from the right side than, okay. um, than left hand. But that, you, you could play this with the left hand too. It, it certainly would work. And now, uh- for, for those of you out there that don't know John, he is a very accomplished TV and film composer. And he's also a great piano player. I've actually done gigs with you uh, while you were playing <coughs> piano. <laughs> so, you know, he, he got this new horn, like, when did you get it, like yesterday or the day before? Yeah, it came like two days ago. <laughs> and then he just wrote and recorded this piece this afternoon. And I'm going to play a little bit of it. It's the tune. You'll recognize piece. the tune. I did yeah. not write this tune. Yeah, no, he, he compo- <laughs> arranged it and, uh, yeah. and played the part. So let's check it out. This is Alfie by, by John ah. Dixon. <laughs> All right, exactly. <laughs>
we were all muted for a second there. Sorry. Oh, oh, okay. So, yeah, sorry. You were Somebody asking about a the, uh, piece the song called prayer. prayer? Yeah. Right. Good. Um, when you, when we sometimes are sweating over a big piece that you know is going to be good, um, you might be going crazy over it, and then you might think, oh, I need one more little something at the end, um, just this little something, um, and that might take five minutes instead of two weeks. And sometimes the thing you write in five minutes, you realize, oh, that's the best, one of the nicest things I've ever done, even though it's really <laughs> simple. So this is a, I, I wrote it as an afterthought, as a little um, coda to a whole long record, and it's only tenor trombone and bass trombone and horn. That's all it is. It's But it's with the great Dave Taylor mm -hmm. on um, mm -hmm. bass bone and uh, Steve Swell on tenor bone. And it's really simple, but I was really happy with it. Very cool. Let me, let me just play this uh, snippet I have here. Let's see. Tom Prayer dot wave. There we go. Oops. Let's <laughs> And I think there's more to the piece, right? <laughs> so, but I'll put links to that. And, uh, you know, again, in the uh, show notes page, it'll have links to these guys' bios, their SoundCloud, and whatever they've got, Apple Music or YouTube channels, whatever they've got going on. So and that was a really beautiful That's piece, That's very Tom. cool. And uh, the, the boards are lighting up for both those pieces. Everybody seems to like it. And uh, let's see, <laughs> going there, well, Joyce and Jeffrey both live in Washington. And Joyce says she's seen you play several times. So uh, yeah. Hi, uh, Joyce. My friend Anna from... Las Vegas, Hyena, and then also Gabrielle is from Florida, and she said, John, your piece was beautiful. I'm sure well, she thanks. thinks Tom's was also. It's funny, because <laughs> they're getting it delayed anywhere from one to five minutes behind us, so sometimes I always forget to say, if you like the piece, put the name of the piece you like, because I have no idea what they're clapping for. But Kim just is clapping. globally say you like them all. That's okay. Yeah, just <laughs> uh, Phil is our regular from... Uh, from Ontario, he comes to almost every show. He's back again, and then. But I do want to give a shout out. Ben and Andre uh, have sent in tips, so thank you very much. Andre is maybe nice. our most consistent tipper. So Andre, Why, thank, thank you, you very Andre. Much. Yeah. Sweet. And Ben, who is uh, performing here in, in a month or so, has also just sent a tip in. So we are, again, we are entirely tip based. Tips get distributed between the people you see on the screen, and uh, you're every little bit. No amount is too small. No amount is too large either. You know, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I keep saying, I think if you want to donate more than a million, you, you have to do it in separate chunks. I don't think you can do Just more. do it but in bearer bonds or uh, exactly. some kind of stock. It's fine. Maybe a new motorcycle fine. for Bill. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, you know, while we're here, I'm going to do this is my little commercial for the upcoming shows. If you guys will give me a second. Let me just put this up there. And uh, oh, there I am. So coming up, we, we just booked a bunch of people. So this is next this Thursday, which is two nights from now. We're doing a best of show. It's the best of 2021 and a half, the first half of the year. And it's a clip show. And I might have some live guests. I just came up with the idea Monday because we didn't want to have a dark night. So come hang out for that. And then the following week, Brad Rebuchin's trio is coming in. 
and that's with Sandro Feliciano and I think Steve Billman is playing bass. And then we have the Nick Gomez Quartet coming back. They were great as a young tenor player. And Michael O'Neill, the, the, the great guitar player, is playing with him. Quinn Johnson, whoop, I misspelled his name. There's two N's. Sorry, Quinn. Uh, he's coming in with the piano. I think it's a trio. And then Conganus is coming back. They are the full orchestra Latin quartet. These guys are amazing. It sounds like a full orchestra. It's just the four guys. And then we have Wonder Group, which is David Hughes, uh, Jamie Tate, Justin Smith, and Ben Thomas, who just tipped, is coming in. And then after that, we have Sippin' Time, which is Larry and Nikki Steen. They also have with yeah. them Chris Blondell and uh, Yaron Levy. So, and we're booking more. So that's every Thursday night is live jazz. Uh, and then twice a month, my schedule, I'm in and out of town, so twice a month we're doing jazz roundtable shows. And I think the next one after this, might, we might go back and do part two of History of the Jazz Guitar because we barely scratched the surface last time. So anyway, that is my commercial for what's coming up on Live at Zero BPM. Nice. So, but back to these guys. And, uh, uh, oh, Bill's got his horn out, but he, it's too late for him to play, I think. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Bill just is in Florida. Out the just to line. show you, it can be <laughs> oh, even more yeah. complicated. Wow. Yeah. Explain that. Explain the is that a triple? That one. Beautiful. Yeah. It's just a triple. So, so you have three layers of tubing here. F, B flat, and then high F. And you have two triggers to go between them. Wow. Mm -hmm. I have is to that admit, a Yamaha triple? Huh? Is that Yamaha? No, Alexander. Oh, it's mm. an Alex. Okay, gotcha. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of horns. See it in there. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> sure. Yeah, there it is. Now, imagine if you've got to learn all your arpeggios, all your scales, all your changes, all your two fives, and learn how to figure out that instrument. Yeah. And it's a <laughs> lot of work. I need to make it's a 12 I stuck with the double. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's that's you know, that's one reason you don't see more of us doing this. And and yeah. the whole backwards bell thing, we're we're at a disadvantage a lot of time in a in a live setting. I've played not near as many solo jazz gigs as these two gentlemen have, but I've been on a lot of big band gigs, a lot of jazz gigs, playing in a mm -hmm. sea of bell front instruments, and you're the only couple of jackasses mm -hmm. aiming backwards mm -hmm. into the back of the wall. <laughs> well, and John, what do you I do will... with that? But because miking a bell on a horn is not a good solution either. So right. we're, we present no. a If it's a quandary. small enough group, if it's not necessarily a really big, big band, mm -hmm. and if there's a, a small, if there's, um, I would sometimes sit with the saxes in the front, and I would be at the end, and I would sit like this. Kind of cheat. Uh, sideways. And I'd play like this. You know, yeah, cheat the bell out. So, um, even though it's not traditional, or if I'm playing um, in a group, especially if you're lucky enough to have the acoustics be so that you don't need any mic at all, mm -hmm. I will stand with my right side to the audience um, and mm -hmm. physically move, move and sway however you need to, depending on uh, the need of that moment. But then at least. Yeah, it's not the old classical sound, but at least you can um, you can project in a way that you can't when you're playing directly mm -hmm. backwards. Right. And um, right. so I've been doing that for years and years, actually, better than a mic. Yeah. Well, but you have to be in the right situation where it's a, a, a sensitive drummer or more chamber music uh -oh. or something like that. <laughs> oh no! Which we do. We do have them. He just, just ruled out all the gigs. <laughs> I'm sure, Billy, if you were playing drum set, Billy's you'd be very able sensitive. to get I, I don't brushes. Play, I don't play drum set, but if I did, okay. I would be sensitive. But, you know, I, yeah, I, the first time sensitive. I heard French horn in a big band, I played in Bruce Lofgren's big band. He was actually a guest on the Jazz Roundtable a while ago. He's in a yeah, great yeah. arranger, and uh, that's where I met Tawny. And, I, John, have you ever played? You've played in that band. Yeah, you? sure. You bet. Yeah, it was the first time. And what he does with the French horns is what an amazing color to add to that big band sound it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, but he's also yeah. using yeah. the doublers the horn the woodwinds on every instrument conceivable so it's right. really right. a beautiful sound and then i did some i think does uh ron jones uses french ron horns jones sometimes. loves mm -hmm. it kim richmond loves it kim richmond. um david angel's yes. uh chamber jazz band here in mm -hmm. la you know classic california west coast jazz sound mm -hmm. 
there are a lot of guys that that knew that even if you're not sitting in an improv chair which you certainly don't have to but it's a right. nice thing to be able to do the color of horn and what it right. can add either mixed with woodwinds or woodwind doublers or or with the brass it's it's just all about how much uh zing we want to put in the sound it's Mm -hmm. It is a flexible, brilliant instrument in that context, especially if you know actually how to write for it. Right. And you're not just doubling trombones with it, you know, if you really know what to do with it. It can be this beautiful glue where the listener mm -hmm. might not even know there's a French horn being mm -hmm. played there. But if it's right. doubling an alto or a tenor sax or it's, it's doing its own thing... They go, ooh, ooh, right. like that's <laughs> nice. When you hear Gil Evans, when you hear Claude Thornhill, yes. when you yep. hear um, some of those great Thad Jones tr um, tracks where they did have um, French horn on some of them or yeah. um, uh, other more modern modern groups too. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's a, it's a it's great a beautiful color sound. to just slide into, yeah. slide into other textures. Right. And, um, yes. Right. But now Klaus Ogerman did a lot of good horn writing too. He he wrote yeah. some wonderful stuff for a horn. And mm. also in those medium sized bands, where like Birth of the Cool, nine piece, ten piece, eleven piece, ten tets. Yeah. I love to play in bands where there might be one trombone, one horn, two saxes, two trumpets, mm -hmm. piano, bass, and drums. And it's like yeah. this, you have this wonderful flexibility, yeah. too. Yeah, that's cool. But uh, now, John, you you. Uh, you, I have some other pieces by you, which I'm going to play little snippets. Well, you, you edit these down, but I've got two of those, and then I want to get to that video <laughs> you, you were yeah. going to play for us. But which video's these, kind of nuts. Do you want to hear, should I play the mellow tune or the horny Christmas? Uh, do a little of the, of the Christmas tune. This, is, this actually went with the video I did last Christmas. I love, um, I played horn in a lot of big bands. I played uh, some movie dates and things that were written in, that, in a kind of a commercial big band style played in a lot of uh, pops orchestras and things and um the horns usually have a nice single line to play maybe a couple lines to play so this mm -hmm. was if everybody else got fired and only the horns were left uh, <laughs> this was my concept for, for a little bit of this get rid of everybody it's updated else. farewell <laughs> symphony <laughs> exactly <laughs> well, well, and me, i did it for christmas i did it for me, christmas let me play a little bit of this here great john it was a, that's just a snippet from a larger piece now you've got it up on your youtube channel and everything or yeah that was a thing i did a, a concept totally goofy uh santa's elves were tasked to make christmas ornaments for uh, a tree hor french horn ornaments mm. uh and the santa claus is a, at the beginning of it he's furious at the elves because this is the size ornaments they made <laughs> instead <laughs> and created a, a, a quandary and so the elves are tasked with fixing it so their task is to find bigger and bigger trees so the ornaments are in proportion so ah. I dressed as elves and I put myself 10, 12, 15, 20 of me in bigger and bigger trees and the punchline is I end up at 30 Rock in the big tree at 30 oh, Rock at nice. the end. <laughs> so well, I am going to put that link in the uh, show notes because now I want to see it. <laughs> but uh, This is what you do when you can't go to Trader Joe's because they won't let you out of your house. <laughs> well, yeah, but a lot of guys are recording videos at home, but you took it to another level. <clears throat> do you want to play that, uh, that other video for us? Uh, sure, I'll let you see it. This is, again, you know, um, this all started with the, with the project that Tom had uh, huh. a bunch of horn players do. 
just uh, which was a, a series of, of dozens of just little improvised 30, 45 second snippets. Just play yeah. whatever you want. And 15, I, just basically really... 15 seconds. Uh-huh. And then boom, right. boom, boom, boom. Uh, it's based it's, on a poetry, poetry form where, where you don't know what the other person is doing and you and then you put it all together. Oh, yeah, wow. just made me excited about doing this. So I'll I'll show you uh, this one. Why don't you put it up there and I will pop you. In I was such a uh, Maynard nut as a kid. I, this is just a tribute to Maynard. And, OK. Uh, OK. It's a lovely uh, gray screen. I know it's coming. <laughs> Give me a here we go. Totally inspired me to up my video game now, John. Now I've, got, I've got the green screen as well, but uh, that's great. And the arrangement's killer. The playing's great, so that was really fun. Thanks. That was uh, started uh, by an arrangement. It's a guy named Greg Schlecht, uh, a group called that I love is a quartet called Four Hornsmen of the Apocalypse, mm. who cornered the best oh, yeah. name of a quartet out there. Yeah. Did the base of that. And I bought that a number of years ago and never played it. And... I thought, you know, I'll do it, but I'm going to add the things back that the original had that they left out of that arrangement. There are mm-hmm. a few little asides, a few little fills, um, and then loosen up the style. I mean, um, horns can play bends and rips and doets, and we can do all that stuff. Yeah. A lot of it is is just to uh, listen to the idiomatic playing by the instruments that do it all the time yeah, and emulate that on the horn and then you figure out whatever else you have to do to make it work on our instrument. But I think listening is the biggest thing. The more you listen to good jazz singers and good jazz instrumentalists, the more you translate it to, to what we're doing. That was Julius's genius is he played a French horn jazz the way Miles played it, you know, and the guys that were his contemporaries on other instruments. I think listening is, is as key as anything else. That's great. We, we can do a lot of half valve sounds that are very expressive, like even more expressive than a trumpet can in some ways. But we can also make kind of cello sounding ponticello, ponticello and sort of those strange string mm-hmm. sounds 
Um, and can um, you and demonstrate can, that? Whether we want sure. to or not, sometimes. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, here's this I'm not so bad at. So that's just like one tiny little, we could do very low, we can do, very, we can do those things higher, we can make, play with the overtone series, but with all of our um, valves half up, half down. So the air right. doesn't know where to go. <laughs> and it goes like, what are you doing to me? And it can be very, very that's primal. just like one of many expressive things we can do. And now going takes back, it to back, that, back to the takes it back to the conch shell a little bit. Yes. It's very primal sounding. Yes. <laughs> is that yeah. uh, is that because of the rotary valves you talked about earlier? Is it yes. Because of that? it's the okay. split. You can get these amazing split tones uh -huh. with um, the rotary half half this way, half that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you can pop on on some horns, especially Con ADs, old old horns. You can make the, those. Um, split tones pop like a high octave oh, things like that right. as we yeah the, some of the crush know. bee bins can do that the guyers right. will do it interesting right. yeah but okay. but the guyer Alex styles can do it in other not. ways <laughs> cool. this is a this is a paxman so it's it's a it's not exactly a guyer it's its own animal but it's much more similar to a guyer and mm -hmm. um Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So you can do cool. Uh -huh. um, sounds like Holtons electronic can music do that. almost. Yeah. yeah, Holtons can do that really well. Cool. Well, I, I, you know, we can we can keep going for a little bit if you guys have more to talk about it. But I just want to do some shout outs. I haven't mentioned some people. Charles from Texas is a French horn player. Jeffrey from Washington, which you said. Gabriella is from Florida. Uh, and Joyce, and I just want to make sure that we got everybody. I like to say hello to everybody that comes in. There yes. lots of, the fun thing about this show is that there's a group of hardcore regulars, Kim and Toby and, and uh, Phil, and they have chats going on about what <laughs> is going on. It's really kind of fun. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm trying to think if there's a couple other people. Oh, but, no, Keiichi who, from Japan says, in jazz ensemble, I love to join in the trumpet section instead of fourth trumpet. That makes the sound mm -hmm. of the section richer, which is a really yeah. cool concept. Uh, and yeah. then also, I want to say, uh, is it? We have we have another historian here. I think it's uh, boy, I'm just scrolling up to find her. I think it was Joyce that is, keeps throwing out these little tidbits in here. But mm. there's so many chats, I can't find her original post. Oh, she says Ralph Towner plays the French horn. That's true. That is I, true. Uh, although I haven't yes. heard him play it in that much, especially as years have passed. But also Bob Rauch yeah. is somebody who has played yes. both jazz and classical French horn. Yes. Mark yeah. Taylor yes. as well. Yes, Mark. Mark, Mark Taylor um, is a terrific player. Uh, and of yes. course, we have Rick Todd, Vincent Chancy, yep. I've mentioned, and there's lots yep. of younger younger people, Giovanni Hoffer, uh, Victor, who was in out there in um, um, f from Brazil, mm -hmm. um, Yuri from Tokyo, um, and other young young ones that are only out of college of out of the last say five or six years that are really quite good. And, and, yeah. um, Plus, you've got. So. Uh, I got a shout out to Tom Bacon. I worked with Tom some when I was yes. in Houston. Yes. Tom was yes. was was is is such a free spirit on the horn and That's could cool. could do yeah. a lot of the really athletic uh, jazz things that trumpet and trombone players do easily and he recorded a lot of really cool stuff for horn as well, well let's make sure we can find a list of names and i'll try to find links to uh to their recordings or videos or whatever just so uh our audience can come back look at that uh, yes the show notes and get uh, it'll take me a couple of days to put that together and to mix this down because this gets turned into a podcast also so if you're listening as yes. a podcast you know go to the show notes they'll pop up there as well they're having a little bit of a technical difficulty getting them published lately is I have a plug in that's not letting not letting me publish. So the the last one, the history of jazz guitar still has to come out. But I guess if you're listening to this okay. on a podcast, the other one will be out as well. So uh, I mean, I'll just edit this out. But. 
But Billy, other yeah. people who, for them, it's five in the morning yes. in Europe. Can they come and watch this? These, um, these are archived later streamed? forever. The same links Great. will get you to Facebook, like, YouTube, and Twitch. Okay. So uh, yeah, these stay up forever, and you can tip. Uh, you know, we get tips sometimes like <laughs> six months later. Somebody stumbles across a video and then send the tip. Cool. In it. I, it's cool. all you know when you go to the tip jar link. You can pull and select who you wanted the tip right. to go to, and that's the thing. I and, told people that, and I want to make sure. Yeah, we. I wanted to yes. mention very briefly oh, Robert sure. Northern, brother, brother yes. of Bob Northern, brother of. was yeah. a he great just passed also last year. pioneer who just passed about mm, a year yes. ago. A year um, ago, mm -hmm. play. He studied with Gunther Schuller, and he was a great classical player, and but played with Thelonious Monk, and then played with lots of. Um, great people and then sort of took a turn to like um, world music, African music, ethnomusicologist, um, taught at many colleges uh, and mm -hmm. was in Washington DC for many years but he just died about a year ago. So he was mm -hmm. he was important in this lineage as well. Yeah, yes. Arkady is another guy, Arkady Shikloper yes. in, in uh, Russia is doing some really fun yeah. stuff, you know, pushing the pushing the jazz fusion thing right. especially. Right. Uh, and oh, in the links, in the links, you should put down the um, the jazz modes. Yes, which is the... the idiomatic of the uh, sextet that would play standards, and you can hear some incredible horn playing there. Right. That was Julius, Julius with Char Charlie Rouse, and it was okay. an incredible yes. group. I'll make sure you have some links. Well, if you're out there and you're watching and you want to uh, get on our mailing list, I don't spam you. I send out one a week. Just goes out on Mondays, talks about the shows that are coming up that week. But that will also, next, next Monday, we'll have the link to the show notes. They'll be up Friday okay. probably uh, once I get this all edited. I edit the audio, compress it, make it beautiful for listening. And that takes a couple of days. But I'll get that up. But the show notes will be up soon as well. So get on the mailing list. It's just, do I have a mailing list lower third somewhere? There you go. Look at this. Magic. As if just Look at there. Go to liveatbpm.com. Wow. <laughs> so, and this, there's a link right on the button right on the front that says get mailing list. It's also right next to the tip jar link. So if you're there, you're feeling uh, like you want to throw <laughs> five to a million dollars at us, that, that would, every little bit helps. So, uh, yeah, horns are expensive. Yeah, they are very yeah. expensive. Yeah. <laughs> expensive. Yes. So is Tell me about it. So is Especially these here. triples. These triples cost like cars. <laughs> yeah, what was, one of the comments was... Like motorcycles. Yesterday. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like <laughs> motorcycles, yeah. Yeah. So, but I think we're going to... I think unless there's something else, but we should get together again and maybe do this down the road. Uh, once a year, we should... Uh, during the, uh, yes. it's, it's International Horn Symposium, right? Is that what's going on? Yeah, now? this right. week, instead of in one place, it's all, kind of all over. Um, and there's lots and lots of um, lectures and talks and concerts. Let's hope in a year it will actually be again. Yeah. Yes. Where we can hug and kiss each other. Yeah. And, exactly. Uh, drink beer together. <laughs> yeah. And, and, Two oh, years yes. ago was, beer. was wonderful. The Two beer. years ago was beer. just the best. <laughs> yeah. And I, I want to shout out again to Tawny Lynn for, for putting this, yes, getting thank this you. started. Because yeah, she, she had she did the good. idea, since it was all going to be virtual, but to get you guys on here, this is really interesting. And I honestly, you know, except for a couple of cats here in town, I wasn't really thinking. So now I'm going to go out and I'm going to fill my you know, my playlist with French horn jazz. Yes. <laughs> the complete Tom Varner series. We're you know, now in the know. hundreds instead yeah. of the fives. <laughs> the fives. Instead right. Of, there must be dozens of them out there. No, that's great. Yeah. So, and hopefully Tens some people of tens. Out there. But again, <laughs> yes. get on the mailing list. Shoot us a tip. Whatever you want. You send some comments in and uh, we'll get it to you. But I'm going to play the outro, which is talking about what's uh, coming up next. So uh, thank you. Let's get a, a big hand for John Dixon and uh, Tom Varner. And Bill Warnick. And thank you guys. Here is thank you, the everybody. outro. Thanks for having us, Billy. Sure. Great well, to see you. Thank you oh, very much, yeah. Billy. Good to see you guys. Uh, and here we go. Where's my magic button? There it is. Thanks for joining us at Live at Zero BPM. These videos we archived on YouTube and Facebook, so tell your friends. Coming up on Thursday, August 12th, it's the Live at Zero BPM Best of 2021 and a Half Show featuring Surprise! You'll just have to come back and see who we pick for the show. Plus, we may have some live guests. Showtime, 7 to 8 p.m. Pacific. And as always, it's free, though donations are really appreciated. Go to live at 0bpm.com for details and to sign up for our mailing list.
Also, find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. See you soon. Thanks for joining us at Live at Zero BPM. These videos we archived on YouTube and Facebook, so tell your friends. Coming up on Thursday, August 12th, it's the Live at Zero BPM Best of 2021 and a Half Show featuring Surprise! You'll just have to come back and see who we pick for the show. Plus, we may have some live guests. Showtime, 7 to 8 p.m. Pacific. And as always, it's free, though donations are really appreciated. Go to live at 0bpm.com for details and to sign up for our mailing list. Also, find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. See you soon!